This morning, I want to uh, preach to you a message I entitled, You Shall Live and Not Die. You Shall Live and Not Die. And I'd like you to open your Bibles to the 118th Psalm, the 17th verse. This is King David. King David wrote this. Uh, King David's life is amazing. He would experience things and then he would write a psalm about it. Here, he wanted to die. He thought his life was over. If you read the verse before this, and the verse after it, you'll see the context of it. But I want to emphasize this today. King David cried out. He says, I shall not die, but live. And I will declare the works of the Lord. I will declare the works of the Lord. King David understood something. He understood that God had a purpose for his life. Although he was king, it was also that he would declare the works of the Lord. September, throughout the world, is known as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And uh, September 10th was World Suicide Prevention Day. Unfortunately, in our country, just after these two days where we're supposed to make ourselves aware of people's needs and the growing crisis in the world, not only in Zimbabwe, but in the world, of how many people are taking their lives, we had one of our very own, a man that I think many of us knew and some of us loved dearly, Barry Dumbaza, a pastor of the Upper Room Ministries here in the city, go to the parkade just near where his offices were and jump and take his life. He committed suicide. None of us that knew him would ever have guessed that he was suffering thoughts or emotions and found himself in circumstances where he would take his life. If you knew this man, you would never have guessed that he would have taken his life. I'm aware of the fact that there are more and more people in Zimbabwe and around the world who are not knowing what to do with their lives and the circumstances that they're facing, especially pastors who are increasingly finding themselves isolated and without a friend. I cannot express to you and I cannot describe to you how important it is that every one of us builds real and lasting, transparent and truthful relationships. You've got to have someone or some others in your life that you can be real with, transparent with, and that you can really tell where you really are. I am so grateful that I have those people in my life. My dear friend Bishop Vaughn was just with me. He came all the way from America to be with me. It was like a breath of fresh air for me. Where do you see, where, amen, yeah, go ahead. Where, where, where does the senior pastor go when he needs to talk to someone? Do I come to you? No, because every time you come to me, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for someone to talk to. So I thank God I have some friends in the church, and I'm deeply grateful for them. And I have some co-pastors that do look after me. But I do have many people that I can go to and open my heart to. On the eve of World Suicide Prevention Day, there was a young pastor in the United States of America, and his ministry was to work with people who were depressed and prone to suicide. He took his own life. Here's what one headline read. It said, Pastor Jared Wilson took his life hours after officiating the funeral of a Christian woman who took her own. Jared was a pastor, husband, father, author, and suicide prevention advocate. He was the founder of a ministry called Anthem of Hope, a Christian organization dedicated to supporting people battling depression, anxiety, self-harm, addiction, and suicide. Here's a picture of Jared baptizing a young girl on the Saturday just a few days before he took his life. 
Just look at the smile and the joy of the embrace that he offers this young lady who has given her life to the Lord. This is what he tweeted two days later after this picture was taken, the same day that he committed suicide. He said, loving Jesus doesn't always cure PTSD. Loving Jesus doesn't always cure anxiety. But that doesn't mean Jesus doesn't offer us companionship and comfort. He always does that. He conducted the funeral of a suicide victim on the day that he took his own life. Listen to what he tweeted just prior to the funeral. Officiating a funeral for a Jesus-loving woman who took her own life today. Your prayers are greatly appreciated for the family. He tweeted it at 201. You know, what, notice, what I notice about this tweet is that he asked for prayers for the family. But what I noticed the most is he didn't ask for prayers for himself. You know, I've officiated over many suicides. I've done the funerals. I've attempted to eulogize people who have succumbed to the awful reality of self-inflicted death. And to do that is sometimes beyond my own ability. You don't know what to say. You don't know how to address it. And I know that there are many of you that and there are many that may be listening on our podcast or listening on our live stream and you're some kind of a religious pundit and you think you know everything. But you know, it's really hard to know how it feels or what it takes to make sense out of someone who takes their own life. Everybody has an opinion. And that opinion is yours to have, but would you just keep it to yourself? Because it's not easy for the family, and I'm sure not for the person. And All I know is this. One thing that I've learned about this type of enigma, this kind of a conundrum, is that when these things occur, never default to what you don't know. See, we have to default to what we do know. Amen. I know this. I don't know what caused the event to occur. I don't know the condition of that person's heart, but I do know this. I do know whether the person has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior or not. I cannot speak to the dead, but I can speak to the living. And so at a suicide, when I do the funeral, and I know the person had had a relationship with Jesus. I don't know the condition of the person's heart when they actually died. I know that when they started to take their life, they were in a terrible place, a depression, a fear, an anxiety, something that they could not overcome. But I don't know that they didn't cry out at the last second. I don't know what their condition was. So I treat it as though they are born again. But I don't speak to the dead, I speak to you, the living. You see, suicide is an act of intentionally causing one's own death. And generally, the risk factors includes mental disorders, depression, bipolar disorders, anxiety, substance abuse, uh, you know, perplexing situations. There's a whole bunch of similar conditions. But not only do we have to deal with suicide, but there's something called attempted suicide. Attempted suicide, when a person attempts to commit suicide, they have every intention of dying, but they survive. When a, fail, when a person fails to take their own life, and this is often very, very challenging for us in the ministry and for those of you in families, when someone you know is so depressed or so anxious or so worried or so broken, that they try to take their lives. The devastation is heartbreaking. So there's suicide, there's attempted suicide, then there's something called parasuicide. Parasuicide is what psychologists are calling it today, where people are 
inflicting self wounds, self harm, with no actual intention of killing themselves, but to draw attention to themselves. Many people mark themselves or they cut themselves. They take a moderate amount of pills, just enough to get really, really sick, but not die. And what they're doing is they're letting people know that they, what they intend to do, but never really wanted to do. Unfortunately, sometimes they do succeed. But it's a cry. It's a cry for attention. It's a cry for somebody to take an interest in them. One thing I'm aware of is how much pain people are in today. Many people don't know how to deal with it. They don't have a place to deal with it. As a pastor, I've been awakened at all hours of the night and morning dealing with people who are involved with various degrees of parasuicide. Bonnie and I have gotten out of bed many a night or been on the phone for hours dealing with people wanting to take their lives. But today, there's one last category of suicide that I'd like to focus on, and it's something called passive suicide. This is something that I believe many of us who love the Lord have battled with and do battle with. Passive suicide is when you think or you speak out loud that you wish to die. Circumstances make you wish you were dead. You feel that way, but you really don't understand what you're saying. For that moment, it appears to be a better option than what you're going through. Have you ever just cried out, Lord, just kill me? Have you ever been beaten down so much that you just cry out, Lord, I wish I was never born? You can't take it anymore. You just scream, Lord, take my life. Please, just take my life. I think of a young girl who wanted to commit suicide because she was jilted by her boyfriend. She didn't really want to die, but she just felt like there's no more living because this guy walked out of her life. It's the end of the world. Some irresponsible little boy and to her at that moment, it felt that way. And she, God, just kill me. I think of a young boy in our church who innocently found out that he had HIV. He was HIV positive. And the first thought was, I, there's, my life's not worth it. I just wish I was dead. I think of a man who lost his job and another who lost his pension that he'd been banking on. He thought it wasn't fair that he would, and it would be easier for him to be dead than to be a burden to his family. And he muttered those words, I just wish I was dead. The Bible says this, it says, do not fear when sudden fear comes upon you. I always used to wonder at that verse. Do not fear when sudden fear comes upon you. Well, how do you not fear when fear comes upon you? This is exactly what it's talking about. We all suffer those kind of jilts. We all suffer those setbacks. We all suffer terrible things that are unjust, unright, unrighteous, unholy, unfair. But let me tell you something. No matter what comes towards me, I need not fear because I am in the palm of his hand. He will take care of me. He will guide me. He will direct me. And I do not need to fear any sudden fear. I had a man who was all set to get a position in the government of RGM. <laughs> and when the cabinet was, this is the first cabinet. He was a member of the church and he was well-known. If I, if, I, if I dropped his name, you'd know who I'm talking about. Well-known. And when the cabinet was finally decided, he was left out. He came to the house. He wept and cried like a baby. 
and he wanted to die. He was embarrassed. He felt like he couldn't face his friends and his colleagues. I was heart, I was heart sore for him. I walked through the crisis with him, and he just kept telling me he wanted to die. But you know, he went on to be an advocate for sports in the country, and God used him anyway, and, and he got over it. But I'll never forget. His first port of call was, I just want to die. You see, people go through hard times. Even in the scriptures, we find people dealing with issues and pressures so intense that what they're going through seems too difficult to bear. There are some things in our lives that can appear to be too difficult to bear. For example, losing a child, a nasty divorce, financial troubles, terminal illnesses, job termination. All these can make you feel like you just want to die. So let's go to the Word of God. You know, when we read the Bible, we find out that we're not alone. Sometimes life can be so hard that you just want to escape this physical realm and toward, head towards the next, your heavenly home. Just let me, let me go home. I want you to know that we cannot allow death to become the solution to try and stop the pain. That is not the solution. There's not a greater man recorded in the Bible than Moses. Moses was, uh, of all men born of women, probably one of the greatest. In fact, a lot of the Bible revolves around this man. God used Moses to accomplish the exodus. God made him a great leader of the Jewish and Israeli people. But listen to what Moses said when the responsibility got too great for him. In Numbers chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, he said, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor, spare me the misery. <laughs> this is Moses. Just kill me. God, just kill me. Spare me the misery. Another man in the Bible is Job. Everybody knows what he, did, he went through. He went through a series of events. He lost everything. He lost his cattle. He lost his houses. He lost even 10 children. He even lost his health. He's scraping his body with a potsherd. Listen to what he said in Job 3, verses 10 through 13. Curse that day for failing to shut my mother's womb, for letting me be born to see all this trouble. Why wasn't I born dead? Why didn't I die as I came out from the womb? Why was I laid on my mother's lap? Why did she nurse me at her breasts? Had I died at birth, I would now be at peace. I would asleep, be asleep and at rest. How about Elijah? <laughs> Here's Elijah. Before I tell you his story, there's one thing we need to remember about Elijah. And we find it in the book of James. It says that Elijah was as human as we are. And yet, when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. The King James says, Elijah was a man of like passion. You know, sometimes we read these biblical figures and we think that why, they're so much bigger than I am. They're so much more real. Listen, they were human beings just like you. If they lived in our day and age, they'd put their pants on just like you do. They would get up and face the same issues and the same troubles just like you do. Elijah, a man of like passion. These people were just like us. So what did Elijah face and what did he do? First Kings 19 it says Elijah was afraid. Of course Jezebel was after him. Jezebel. The real Jezebel. <laughs> she was a wicked thing, hey? 
Jezebel was after him and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. You know, Elijah got so upset. He thought he was the only one left. Nobody else was righteous. He was the only one. And now he's being chased by a satanically driven woman. Bad enough to be chased by a woman, but a satanically driven one. <laughs> Amen. I got one more person I'd like us to consider. I love this guy. Jonah. I mean, this is, Jonah, Jonah's a real guy. Let me tell you something. God tells Jonah, I want you to go preach to Nineveh. He goes down to the boat. He, I mean, he doesn't say no. He just gets on the boat and he says, put me on a boat the opposite direction from Nineveh. Where anything except where Nineveh is going. He says, I'm going the opposite way. And he gets on this boat and he's heading exactly 180 degrees from where Nineveh is. And the boat, you know the story, the whole story. Finally, they throw him overboard and a giant fish swallows him and spits him up on the shore of Nineveh. <laughs> now you have to understand the irony of this because the people of Nineveh worshiped the fish god. Oh yeah, Dagon, the fish god. And so this big fish spits this guy up on the shore. Now I can only imagine what you look like after three days in the belly of a whale. A little bit of seaweed hanging out of your hair. I don't know what those gastric juices did to him, but I'm not sure he looked all that good, okay? And after three days, he staggers up onto the shore, and the rumor has gone out in front of him that, hey, this guy got spit up by Dagon, the fish god. He's here. And he preaches that this nation, who they hate. He hates these people. You have to understand, the Ninevites were the fiercest. They're, these people hated people. These people were ruthless with people. They didn't just kill you. They tortured you. They were ruthless. They had, and, and he wanted God's judgment on the Ninevites. So he goes and he preaches. And unfortunately, they repent. <laughs> and he's very upset. He's very upset because they repented. He's mad. I like this guy. God, kill him. So Jonah finally preached and what God told him. And then he got mad. He got mad when the people repented. And when they got right with God, he was mad. He was mad at the people and he was mad at God. Many people believe that Jonah was upset because of the prosperity of his enemies. Do you ever get that way? Jonah 4, 7 through 11 says this. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm. Now you have to understand. Jonah went up and he planted a, a plant and it grew shade for him. He sat outside the city wall pouting. And he had the shade of the gourd, this, this, this plant and he's sitting under the shade of the gourd and it says, and God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. <laughs> I always loved it. I mean, this guy's real. He plants a little plant that gives him a little, and all he wants is just a little bit of shade, and then a worm eats it. And he wants to die because a worm ate his plant. <laughs> now, wait, wait, sometimes it doesn't make sense, does it? He says, you've been concerned about this vine. Though you didn't tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left 
and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Now, Nineveh was a city of millions, but there were 120,000 that didn't know their left from the right hand. Do you know what that is? Those are infants. Those are babies. They don't know left from right. 120,000 babies. Can you see this? Here we have great men of God. Even these great men of God had their moments of despair where they just wanted to die. This is termed or known as passive suicide. Times when people, men and women who are serving God, have thrown up their, thrown up their hands and said, God, just kill me. Just let me die. I'm done with this world. Make the pain stop. I have no reason to live. I've discovered that the natural thing to do when things get rough for many people is just to want to throw in the towel, just to quit. We want to take the next exit and just get off the highway. We can't take it anymore. We can't take any more bad news. We can't go through any more sleepless nights. We just don't think we can take it anymore. This world we live in doesn't appear to offer much hope for us either. The Bible says that we live in a world where there are perilous times. Perilous times. Things aren't going to get better, I can tell you right now. Things are not getting better. But God will make things better in the midst of the perilous times. Amen? You see, the only way I know how to deal with this issue is to turn to the word of God. You know, we have a worldwide suicide prevention awareness month. And last month, a suicide prevention awareness day. And yet, suicides are increasing across this world, this earth. The word of God teaches us that each of us is here for a specific God-ordained purpose. The word teaches us that God's sovereign plan will eventually unfold for those he's called. God has a plan and he will unfold it. The word teaches us that God will receive some form of glory from our lives. Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God knows what you're going through. He knows what he's doing. Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray for, to me and I will listen to you. I know my end. I know that God has a good plan for me. I know that no matter what I'm going through, no matter how hard it is, no matter how much I don't like it. He has a plan for me, a hope and a future. A good plan for me. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variableness, no shadow, no turning. You know, Job did lose everything, all the way down to his health. But you have to remember this, but before it was all over, he got everything back, double. Think about that. Well, what about his children? I heard somebody say, yeah. Well, he will reconnect with them in heaven. We live for eternity. It's not just what's on this earth. Think with me. Elijah had that moment where he wanted to die and wanted God to kill him. But if you keep reading, he never died. He got a chariot ride. God came and swept down with a chariot and swept him up. And he just threw his mantle off so Elijah could have the mantle. Jonah didn't die. He didn't die in the belly of a whale, and he didn't die under that little plant. But he saw 120,000 babies saved and millions of people in the city of Nineveh come to a repenting knowledge of God. That generation was saved. Later on, that city was judged because they returned 
to Dagon. They've returned to their worship of false idols. But for that generation, because of a righteous man, many were saved. I've got good news for you. God doesn't want to kill you, and God doesn't want you to die. In our text this morning, David was surrounded by his enemies. He was feeling some kind of trouble. He was in some kind of a way. And he was not happy about his walk with God. And it appears to be over for him. But then something kicked into his life. Something kicked into his heart. And he gets a revelation. God loves me. He knows me. He's forgiven me. He's helped me before. He'll help me again. Yea, though I've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Something kicked in. So he says to himself, I shall die. I shall not die, but live. And I will declare the works of the Lord. But I want you to know something. He encouraged himself. He picked himself up and said, I shall not die, but live. And I will declare the works of the Lord. You know, many of us have been, have had bouts with passively, and, and maybe we've been passively suicidal at times. Where we felt like we've had too much to bear, where we feel forsaken, we feel abused. Maybe we're caught up in a cycle of addictive behavior. We just can't stop. I've got news for you. God would not let Elijah die. He would not let Moses die. He would not let Jonah die. He would not let Job die. And he's not going to let you die. These people in the Bible, want to, in the, they wanted to die, but God wouldn't let them. God has a divine plan. He knows. When life gets you down, that's the time to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Having begun a good work in you, he will bring it to completion. Do you remember Hezekiah? Hezekiah, the prophet came to him and said, prepare your house, you're about to die. And Hezekiah turned his face towards God and and, 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 he, and, he, and towards the wall, and he prayed in his deathbed, and he said, oh, God. He said, if I die, I can't praise you from the depths of hell. No one can praise you when they're dead. Spare me. And guess what God did? God heard his cry and gave him 15 more years of life. I'm here this morning to declare to anybody who wants to commit suicide, who has tried to commit suicide, or who wanted to make people think that you wanted to commit suicide. Or who have ever said you want to die and you really don't mean it. I come to tell you that you shall live and not die. You see, for some, suicide is a disease. It's something that's crept into our hearts and minds and it's a sickness. We need to be treated. We need to be talked to. We need professional help. We need friends. We need to walk this thing through. For others, it's a spirit. It comes upon you, and it makes the situation look hopeless. It blinds your mind. It blinds your heart. It blinds your emotions. And in a moment of time when it seems hopeless and helpless, it takes God from the scene. It makes it look like God is not there. It makes it look like you cannot survive. It's a demonic spirit. We need to learn how to rebuke these things, bind these things, curse these things. We need to call on the Lord. We need to encourage ourselves. As I close this morning, I want to let Jared speak to us in his absence. This is what he posted just before he did commit suicide on Facebook. He said this. He says, my name is Jared Wilson. I'm a husband, father, pastor, and author. I also struggle with depression and have for most of my life. I'm not telling you this so that you can feel bad for me. I'm telling you this so people know that they're not alone and that God offers the strength and hope you need to keep going. We've all got things in life we struggle with, he added. We're all imperfect. We're all in need of a perfect savior. You're not alone. It's okay to admit that you're not okay. Admitting your struggle 
is the first step in finding healing. My only comment is this. I wish, I wish that Jared and Barry and others would have availed themselves to the relationships they had around them and their relationship with Jesus. It's not a blog post we need. It's not a twit, tweet, tweet, a tweet, a twit, a tweet. It's not a tweet we need. It's real relationships. It's a real abiding relationship with Jesus. If you're struggling, it's okay. But don't struggle alone. If you know someone who's struggling, be there for them. Embrace them. Don't let them struggle alone. and Don't judge them. You don't know what they're facing. The Bible, one verse in the Bible that's always been my favorite verse. It said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I don't know about you, but I need a lot of mercy in my life. I fall short of the glory of God. As a pastor, I fall short. I need you to be merciful with me. I'll be merciful with you. There are a lot of people here. Hey, they don't want to come to church because they can't keep up the appearance. No, no, there's no appearance. We're all walking to the best of our ability and allowing God to change us. He's begun a good work in you. Jesus said he'll finish it. He's the author and the perfecter. He's not done. It's not over. Your marriage may be under pressure. Your family may be in trouble. Your job, whatever it is, it's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Wherever you're at this morning, whether you're listening on our podcast or on our live feed, whether you're here in the congregation, think about where you are. Think about your own heart. Today's a good day to be honest. Have you ever said, oh, I just wish I would, could be dead? Can we repent of that? I shall live and not die. I will yet tell of his wondrous works. Can you say that after me? Say, I shall live and not die. I shall yet tell of his wondrous works. I shall live and not die. I shall yet tell of his wonderful works. Oh, I'll tell you, there were, there were times in my life where, man, I'm going to tell you something. I didn't want to come to church. There was a time when we were building this building and we misspent, we, we made a mistake and it cost us $100,000 and that was a lot of money. And I couldn't blame it on the building committee. I had to take responsibility. So I did. And I came in front of the congregation that Sunday morning and I said, hey, and I wanted to, I wanted to, I would have, that was one of those times I thought, well, maybe it'd be easy if I just died. Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> I was so embarrassed. And I just confessed. I said, guys, we've made a terrible mistake. Would you forgive me? I don't know how to, I can't repay it. This is what happened. I explained it. It was a, it was a legitimate mistake, but it was, still hard you know that Sunday we had the biggest offering for the building fund that we ever had it was unbelievable people didn't respond by condemning me I did not die I lived and I get to tell that story even today amen amen God will take you through your storm. He'll take you through the fire. 
It will take you through. You may have to go into the fire. I can't say you won't. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to go into a fire. But they came out. Daniel had to go into a lion's den. I think he may have wanted to die that day. But he said, no, I shall live, I shall not die, and I will yet tell of his wonderful works. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on God.